So this talk is about something called inner source. I'll introduce myself in a second. Um, I think the, the success of open source inspires a growing number of organizations to adopt open source principles to build software uh, behind the firewall, so internally within the organization. Um, and I think these organizations, they recognize that open source is like a, a productive way to build software. Um, and drawing inspiration from open source is not new. I mean, it's uh, in the beginning of, let's say, 2000s, already IBM or Hewlett Packard, but also Philips here in the Netherlands, uh, they explored uh, open source concepts of building software internally. And today there's a lot of organizations that, um, yeah, that publicly speak about inner source, adopting open source principles. Uh, PayPal is an example, they even maintain the inner source commons website. Uh, Bloomberg, Walmart are examples, Scania, a truck builder from the, from the Nordics. Uh, Zalando in Germany is a good example. Um, so these are all companies that uh, are inspired by open source software development to build software internally. So my name is Bas Peters. Um, I'm a solutions engineer at GitHub. And at GitHub, solutions engineers are part of the sales uh, department, but we are basically, it is our goal to help customers to, to, to be successful using GitHub. Uh, so who of you is familiar with GitHub? I think most of you are. So, and who is contributing to open source? Uh, is anyone, so there's even a couple of people that contribute to open source, which is great. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so, GitHub is, a, is launched in 2008 as a platform to allow software developers to build software in a collaborative way. Uh, initially, the focus was uh, uh, only on open source, and then with a growing number of organizations using GitHub, um, GitHub also started focusing more on helping organizations to build software in open source, so building a presence in open source, uh, but also use it build software internally. So there's GitHub.com, the platform where you can also have like your private projects, but we also have a product called uh, GitHub Enterprise, allowing you to build software behind the firewall, so you can build your own community if you want. Uh, we're at the Java conference today. Um, <coughs> so this is from our October. So annually we publish um, uh, interesting numbers around uh, the communities on GitHub. So Java today is still like the third language uh, on GitHub. Uh, maybe it's partly due to the success of Android, but it's still like you know a very dominant language uh, in the field. Um, and yeah, luckily even Oracle recently migrated the Java EE to GitHub. I think that's uh, a, a great initiative. Finally, it's a bit late, I think, but uh, okay. Um, <coughs> but of course, a lot of Java development, as we can see that a lot of you are contributing to open source, a lot of Java development happens in open source. But I'll start with an example that is more related to .NET. Um, and I just want to use this to illustrate the impact of open source. Uh, I think today, most software that has an impact in the world uh, kind of originates from open source, uses open source software. Um, take big data, for example, data science, uh, blockchain, infrastructure as code, uh, programming languages. Uh, so these are a couple of examples. And this cake is, uh, it's, it's, this story is about um, Illyriad. It's a gaming company. It's a small company, um, and they are working. I, I don't know if they are already like uh, like general available with the game, but they are developing a game which is like it's Age of Ascent, and it's like um, it's kind of a space opera game, so like Space Invader. So you're a fighter pilot, and you have to conquer the universe, and it is designed as an in-browser game, and it needs to you know scale out massively. Um, so. Uh, anyone can basically, you know, conquer the universe in real time. So they're really pushing the boundaries of the .NET framework. And one of their developers, I think it's uh, Ben Adams, he is really like super creative, and he contributed um, very significantly to uh, the .NET framework to improve performance, to reduce the footprint, especially of the Kestrel engine, for example, the, the .NET HTTP engine. So this is an example where they basically helped um, .NET to you know, significantly increase the number of requests that could be handled by Kestrel uh, per second. 
And I think this is all happening in open source. So what this company is doing is contributing to a programming language that we all use. Uh, so we all benefit from what, uh, what Ben and his team is contributing. Uh, and I think that is you know, a, a good example of how anyone can contribute in open source, and it can even be pretty significant. I mean, you know, if you want to run a massive uh, web application uh, and use .NET, I mean, then you, know, you can thank him for helping you to make your site much faster. So why is open source so successful? Um, and I think one of the reasons uh, that open source software development is so successful is that it addresses a human need, the need that we have to take ownership of our work. So to explore, to create new things, uh, and to learn new skills. And so if you want to understand how this works, you I can recommend reading this book by Daniel Pink. Is any one of you familiar with this book? A few of you are. Um, so, Daniel Pink's book is about what we call like intrinsic motivation. Um, and so, he states that when you follow these three elements, so autonomy, mastery, and, and purpose, um, uh, in within an organization, so if you promote this, you'll do a, a much better job. And so, autonomy is really about um, that people, you know, the belief that people they need to take autonomy over your task, so what are you doing, the time when you do something, um, the team, so who do you collaborate with, and also the technique, so what kind of tools do you need to get the job done. And so if you can take ownership of that, you will do a much better job, you'll be more motivated in order to, uh, to execute your job. Um, so, uh, and I think this Recently, for example, so this is not only in technology. I don't know if any of you is sometimes watching like Tegenlicht, the documentary that is like, uh, I think. So there was like uh, um, a story about Buurtzorg, for example. So even in, in healthcare, um, you can see that they are kind of adopting these principles and they do an, an amazing job. There's even other you know, organizations in healthcare that are kind of blocking them because they're so successful simply by adopting the autonomy. So uh, having like these teams that are completely responsible for taking care of the elderly. Um, and then there's mastery. So mastery is kind of about executing what they call like Goldilocks tasks. I don't know if you're familiar with Goldilocks and the three bears, the fairy tale. Um, so Goldilocks goes into the woods, she finds a house, and in the house she finds like three plates of porridge. And she tastes the first one, it's too cold, and the second one is too hot, but then the middle one is like just right, uh, the temperature, so she eats it all. And that is like a Goldilocks task. So a Goldilocks task is a task that is a challenge for you to complete, but it's it's not too hard and of course not too simple because you have a, if you have a simple task at hand and someone else gives you that task, uh, you will never do a great job, right? You're just thinking about you know, where your mind is. I, I'd love to do this, not that one. So I'll just you know, complete it as fast as I can to go to the stuff that I find interesting. Um, but if you have a task that is really difficult, you're struggling with it, you also get frustrated so you will not do a great job. So Goldilocks tasks are tasks that are just right. There needs to be some challenge but not too much. Um, and of course, the other part of mastery is about learning something new every day. So it, it can be good practice. I don't do it myself, to be honest. But uh, you know, just ask yourself, like whenever you, you know, when you go to bed uh, in the evening or something, like, okay, what have I learned today? Or what are my objectives to tomorrow to learn? And then there's purpose, and our pur purpose is really important. Um, so in open source, anyone can choose the projects you're interested in, you believe you know, you're, you're, if that is meaningful to you. Um, so let's take infrastructure as code as an example. So you might think that like Chef is the best solution, or Puppet is the best solution, or Ansible, uh, and then you can just contribute to these projects. You have the freedom to choose the projects that are meaningful to you. Uh, and that is really, really important. Um, if you are in a team uh, and you know other people just tell you the whole day what you need to do, you, and you do not really have, like you know, you do not have a shared belief of the mission, where is this project going? I don't think you can ever do a great job, and you will not be motivated. So that's why uh, I think companies that do great in, in building software, they have small teams that just get a mission. So like build the best, I don't know, the best payment service, uh, build the easiest way to transfer money, or build the best playlist experience. And these teams focus on that mission rather than you know, people telling them exactly what to build. So, and I think these aspects, they 
ta tell a lot about why open source is so successful. Because when you are, you know, when you contribute to open source, you have this choice. So in this presentation, I want to focus a bit on like talking about some best practices, so that might be helpful to you uh, in in doing software development. Um, so the first one is about sharing your work. Um, what you see a lot, even today in organizations, is that project teams work in isolation. So, and you know they're constantly kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, and of course, we use a lot of common libraries to build software today. Um, but at the same time, uh, some companies have like 40% duplicate code uh, within the organization, simply because teams have no knowledge of other teams what they are building. So maybe the first step can be like put every all developers on a shared single platform, and that at least gives you like visibility of the software that's being built within your organization. Um, so similar to open source, where you can go uh, on an, an open source hosting site like GitHub and find projects, um, and you can read the code, you can learn from the code, you can reuse the code, you can use reuse co complete projects, you can reuse snippets. Um, so it is it creates like a knowledge platform where you can learn from each other. And you could see this the a second stage in when you have a shared platform and you have visibility of code, you could even start contributing to each other's projects. And I think a lot of people, maybe even in this room, might think, uh, I don't think so. I mean, my project is my baby. I won't let anyone you know, touch it because uh, there I'm the best uh, you know, developer. The rest is average. But at the same time, um, so imagine, for example, you're working on some front-end team, you're building uh, uh, an e-commerce site or something, and you have checkout methods, and you want to add, like, I don't know, a PayPal checkouts. Um, so, and you, you go to the payments team that's responsible for, for creating these checkouts, and they say, well, we're five sprints ahead, so maybe, you know, spring next year. So we put it on our backlog, and we get back to you uh, whenever we, you know, have time. And so you end up like chasing the product owner in order to get it prioritized. So that's a lot of work and a lot of frustration. As a developer, you might be curious. So you have visibility of the code, so you jump into the payments project and you see maybe the Klarna checkout or some other like uh, checkout method, and you see that it's kind of pretty similar to the PayPal one you want to implement. Um, so you just start hacking away a little bit, spend a few hours, and you know you get it like you for 80% working. Um, so what you can do then is you contribute back to that project and say, "Hey, payments team, I would love to ship this earlier." And I started working on it, and I've I've done quite a significant part of the job already. So can you please review my contribution, uh, and maybe then you can can get the feature in way earlier uh, than having to wait for the product owner of the payments project in order to prioritize uh, your feature. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I'll talk a little bit more about you know avoiding this, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of has to do with making sure, and I'll talk about this, is making sure that your project has you know, a very clear scope. I think a lot of times uh, projects do not have a clear scope, so people just contribute stuff that you you know you might consider out of scope. Um, so let me let me finish the talk, and then if you still are not convinced that it could work, then please get back to me. Um, because one thing is, um, so if you can share your software uh, on a single platform and maybe even people start contributing, um, there is a couple of best practices that can help you to basically build a culture that, uh, that enables this. And one thing is uh, around documentation. I think the first thing is that your projects should always have kind of a readme file. It should always have like a welcome mat for your project. And what is really key here is that you make clear that what is the purpose of the project, uh, how can you build and run it, so allow people to get easily started with it. Um, <coughs> but it can also help you to explain, you know, what 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 is what does it do, why does it matter, and what makes it kind of you know what makes it different. So a README file can already help you really to scope your project and make it as clear as possible what the purpose of the project is. 
Um, and then the other part is um, uh, also referring to your question. I mean, it's, it's really difficult that if people spend time and contribute to your project and it's considered out of scope, it gets frustrating to contributors. Um, so it can also be uh, ve very helpful to have a clear contributing file where you provide guidelines um, how people can contribute, what kind of contributions you accept, um, and how code is reviewed, for example, what coding guidelines people need to follow. Um, these can really help you in order to, um, to kind of steer a contributor in the right direction. But there's another part of this. Um, it also makes it easier when people contribute and you need to provide feedback as like, you know, something is considered out of scope or it's not meeting your requirements, you can easily refer to this document rather than having to go into a lengthy discussion with the contributor um, ab about the contribution. Of course, you can go way beyond. Um, this is an example from <coughs> the .NET documentation, so you can also build like document extensive documentation uh, alongside your code, and people can then use the same kind of contribution workflow. The other part is around um, to require like public and also focused code review. Um, so this is a typical pull request workflow. Most vendors that provide uh, source control software uh, have adopted this workflow based on pull requests. Um, so initially you create a feature branch, you create a couple of commits, and then you open a pull request. So you basically, um, you ask, you start asking feedback from your peers. And that is another thing reflecting to your question is, open a pull request as, you know, as early as possible to avoid having to sp spend a lot of time on building a feature um, without having any feedback from your peers. Um, <coughs> because then it might be the case that you kind of you know, invest like a week's time and then someone will say, well, if you use this library and include it, you'll have pr practically the same capability. Or you know, to meet our guidelines, can you please you know, uh, take it into this direction? Uh, so the earlier you request feedback, you know, the more the chances that people will accept uh, your uh, contribution. Um, <coughs> so there's a couple of, uh, I think, benefits. Uh, you can have a lengthy discussion about, you know, uh, trunk-based development versus pull request development. Um, but I think <coughs> one of the benefits of using a pull request-based development and using branch-based development is that a branch it basically, it always, it's never blocking. You can, you know, people can always continue to develop because you do your changes on your branch. So like isolate it from the main branch, for example. Um, and the other part is uh, you can freely experiment. So you create a branch, start coding, and if it fails, you can just close a pull request or you can delete your branch and you're not having any impact on the master branch on production-ready code. And pull requests <coughs> can help you to to collaborate, to, to collect feedback from your peers. In pull requests, there is one sp uh, part that is like really important, and that is what we call like the feedback loop. So if you write a pull request, it is very important to be clear about what are your changes about. So what is the goal you want to reach? And of course, uh, if you start contributing, make sure that what you are trying to reach, the goal you're trying to reach is aligned with the, 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 the purpose and scope of the project. Um, and then make clear where, where are you in developing? Are you, have you just made a few commits and are you experimenting? Uh, so do you just want to have you know, feedback around the ideas? Am I heading into the right direction? Or have you already coded most of the, of the feature and, you, and do you want line by line code review? So make clear what kind of feedback you expect from others. Then when people provide feedback, so if someone is doing code review, um, then as a developer, when you do something with, that, uh, with these change requests, um, make sure that you provide feedback back to the reviewer. If they never hear from you, I don't know if they will review or your work the next time. So, and that kind of closes the feedback loop. And I think that is really important. So make sure it's a, a dialogue uh, between the developers and between people that provide uh, uh, um, feedback. It's also always important to be responsive. I recently received an email from one of our customers, and they're a large customer, so they have thousands of developers. And they had issues that, you know, they have many pull requests that were open too long, and they wanted to do something about it. Um, and even, 
even if you're not able to spend time on doing extensive review and someone is requesting it, at least provide some feedback. Um, this is a nice example. So this is someone who is working on some new feature and the person who is supposed to do code review is traveling. So he's not able to spend a lot of time on the, on the code changes, but at least he provides some feedback so the person contributing can continue uh, his work. And I think that is important. And then maybe at some later stage, he or someone else uh, could then basically do the code review. Another trick is uh, to foster, you know, to help others to start contributing to your projects. And I, I personally love this example, is to basically uh, push people through what we call like the contribution funnel. So make users, turn users into contributors. So someone finds a small bug uh, in documentation in this case, it's just a broken link. So if you own that documentation, if you work on it, um, you could just easily solve it within like seconds. But uh, rather than doing that, why not provide feedback to the initial reporter and say, hey, can you open a pull request for me and fix it? And then I'll merge it in. And that turns that user into a contributor to your project. And it also gives that person the feeling that he's kind of co-owning that project because he contributed. It's a very neat trick, I think, uh, to turn users into contributors. Then a lot of organizations that um, are successfully in kind of building a culture where people start contributing, um, they introduce something called repository maintainers, or like you could say trusted committers that are very known in like the Apache open source model. Um, <coughs> so basically they have people that kind of own the repository, so they're very familiar with the code, and they take some responsibility of uh, reviewing incoming requests. Um, <coughs> and maybe your first response is like, oh, that uh, seems to be like a super boring job. I never want to do that, uh, doing code review. Uh. So it, of course, can easily be like a rotating job, um, or you can do it as a team. So it's not something, you know, you, that you should not like dedicate one person to doing only code review, only working on incoming requests. But this is a person that you could say is like more like uh, a, a group of product project owners, um, and they, of course, also work on like guarding the scope and purpose of the project. So if you then look at a typical model <coughs> um, uh, for inner source, then there is users of your project, um, um, <coughs> uh, so people that use the software that deploy it maybe and bring it to your end customers. Um, and then they can turn into contributors, start contributing to your project. So they will have their own projects that they have a primary focus on, but they can also um, uh, contribute to other projects. And they can turn into like collaborators where they have right permissions. So contributors will typically work in a fork, a copy of the project, because they only have read permissions, where um <coughs> collaborators have more right permissions, and then there's the maintainers that kind of own it. So a few examples of where we see, like, uh, you know, you might think, where do I start contributing? Typically, where we see a lot of success in this model is uh, infrastructure as code. So uh, if you use like things like Puppet or Chef or Ansible to manage your infrastructure, there you typically see a lot of contributions from within the organization because there's a lot of different kind of skills that are required to maintain your infrastructure. Take database experts, security people, uh, web server specialists. So they are all over your organization. So there you typically see this culture uh, uh, coming. And then there's also, for example, widgets. So if you have a lot of user, if you have a user interface library that is shared among different products within your organization, there you also typically see happening that people start contributing uh, to projects. A challenge when you start contributing and when there is visibility of code across the organization um, is to you need to constantly kind of fight technical debt. Um, because if people find bad examples, you do not want those bad examples to be you know, spread out in over your code base. So at least one thing you can do, you cannot always continue to refactor. Ideally, you would do that, but it's not always possible because you won't have the time. Um, so at least then if you find a bad example that is reused, then maybe you can just create a command line in the code or something that people should not reuse this, but f you know, go to some other uh, place. And then, of course, it's key to <coughs> uh, make sure that you implement rigorous testing. So automate as much as you can. Um, and out test automation is great for you yourself because you will know you pass all the tests. And for example, you will know that if you're working on some branch and that, you know, would you merge it into master now that it would, you know, merge without any issues. 
Um, but it also creates confidence. So if people contribute to your project, you cannot always direct immediately kind of provide feedback. So if you have continuous integration running, uh, then at least people get feedback from the CI server whether they pass all the tests. It might not you know, say like that the code is 100% ready, but at least they pass. <coughs> so it will be like a guarantee that the work has some level of quality. And I like this example to kind of emphasize the importance of uh, continuous integration. So this is the Apple Swift project. <coughs> Initially, only Apple employees were kind of allowed to become like maintainers of the project. So these kind of um, uh, trusted committers. And <coughs> when they, at some point, they published, uh, I think it was uh, end of February last year, they said, well, now that our continuous integration system is established and proven, so now that it gives some level of guarantee that the quality of the, the code is good, um, we open up the project for people outside Apple to become uh, committers of the project, so to become maintainers. So if you've, I think, uh, if you successfully merge five pull requests that are kind of significant and without too much uh, uh <coughs> change requests, then you can become a maintainer of the project. And this is simply because their CI system was established and proven, so gave some guarantee uh, for quality. <coughs> and the great thing for contributors is that when you use CI, it provides a constant feedback loop. So whenever you push changes, CI will run and will provide you with feedback uh, straight into the pull request <coughs> where you discuss all code changes. So code review done by humans and by the system are all in one place and that gives you kind of a confidence. Then, of course, the other part of automation is uh, con uh, out to automate your deploy, so like the, the continuous delivery um, model. Now, there are a lot of different uh, models. So I'll talk a little bit about how we deploy code at GitHub. So one thing, um <coughs> we ship code into production, or let me phrase it a little bit differently, we verify our features in production from a feature branch. So typically, a developer will create a branch, start building a feature, and then this feature is, of course, extensively reviewed by multiple people, and it runs successfully through our CI system. Um, but then at some point, uh, they are ready to kind of ship a feature into production, and they will initially, they will first verify that into production. So that means that if you go to gitter.com, uh, very often you will look at a feature branch rather than at the master branch. For us, the master branch is the branch we can always roll back to as kind of you know a, a safe way of making sure that we always have a stable version of GitHub running for you. Um, <coughs> I'll not talk about the, the details of deploy, but uh, one thing is that you can use, uh, on GitHub, you can use deployment statuses. So basically, in the pull request, you can see what is deployed into production. Um, and the way we deploy is that we use this whole model of autonomy. So engineers make these decisions. An engineer makes a decision whether to deploy or not. Um, so it is not something that is like automated. So when something is merged into some other branch, it will then automatically trigger a deploy. So we do this through um, uh, a chat uh, environment. So we use Slack internally. So basically, we run all our operations from within Slack. So you do a dot that is addressing Ubot. Uh, Ubot is a bot that we use. It's an open source project that you can use. And basically, it's a chat bot. So it sits behind a chat environment. So it has all sorts of plugins for chat environments. And we do dots. So we call Ubot. And then we say, Ubot, deploy this branch into this environment. Often a developer, developers can deploy to like lab environments, development environments. We also have a kind of, you can deploy into Canary, that is quite typical. So we make sure that when a feature is production ready, they first deploy it into Canary. So it's kind of, you know, reflecting production, but only with a very low uh, number of requests. And then they basically deploy it into production itself. And then it gets verified and then it's merged um, into the master branch. For us, it was at some point uh, very uh, difficult to just have a staging environment that reflects, you know, kind of production. So that's one of the reasons we decided to just uh, push uh, from a feature branch into production. And then once a feature is merged in, that uh, it happens quite quickly. It m in most times, it's within minutes or maybe up to like 10 minutes or something. Uh, this feature is tested in production, so it's monitored. 
Um, <coughs> and if it's not you know, uh, having a, a kind of a negative impact on the production environment in terms of exceptions or performance, uh, uh, then they merge it in and then the next feature can go. It's like a queue. So the next engineer uh, gets notified by U-Bot that the queue is uh, available for this developer and the developer can then ship the next feature. So using this model, we deploy, I think, average so 200, 300 times every week into production. Uh, so it's kind of something that is continuously going on. <coughs> the other part I want to talk briefly about is uh, more related to culture and about sharing your experiences and the importance of sharing your experiences. Uh, one thing that is, I think it's uh, something that is hard to do, but ideally you would embed learning and knowledge sharing into your organization. I think in this context, I kind of, I think the Spotify model became very famous in this, but not everyone is following it, uh, the part that is really important, because that is like the chapter model. Um, so at Spotify, they introduced this model with squads that are teams, uh, tribes, so that is like release trains. Um, and then they have chapters and guilds. And basically, the way they are organized is that, um, so they have small teams, and the problem is, w with all these small teams, you only create smaller silos. So you only make a problem of, you know, the, the, the challenge of, um, of knowledge sharing harder, because you have all these small silos, every silo has like a mission, and they just work on that mission to get something shipped. Um, so the teams, uh, from idea to production, a, a team is responsible for some feature. Um, <coughs> so what they did is basically people that have the same kind of expertise and skills, or have the same role, they've put together within a tribe, so within a product group or release train, into a chapter. So that is kind of horizontal over those teams. And every chapter has a line manager, so a very traditional, you could say, line manager. In a sense, a manager that is responsible for your career development, your salary, uh, your is doing your res performance reviews and stuff like that. But at the same time, um, these chapters come together very frequently. So the people that are database experts, front-end developers, uh, data scientists, whatever kind of role, and they come together frequently, like on a weekly basis, to talk about the challenges they face. So that is a way embedded into the organizational structure in order to, um, to help people uh, to share knowledge and also being able to get help from other teams, uh, from people that are in your role. And I think that is a, a great way of, you know, also showing from a management uh, perspective that you basically um, consider knowledge sharing and learning important uh, for your organization. Another thing, so basically uh, you could call this like communities of practice. They are not voluntary, um, so it's not something like, oh, this morning I'll, you know, I'll just do something else and then next week I might go. It's non-voluntary, so basically you, you get together on a weekly basis and you help each other out. Um, <coughs> and that is opposite to like communities of interests, and that, that are the guilds uh, in the Spotify terms, where people just, you know, you might have a monthly meetup and it will be about a, uh, maybe if you want to learn more about data science and there is like a meetup around data science uh, and you might be in a front end team, you just, you know, can go to that meetup. So it's, n it's a voluntary event allowing you to learn more about technologies you might be interested in or maybe some technology you might, you know, go into like in your career. Um, so that, that is more like a voluntary uh, activity. And I like that model, this kind of community of practice being a way to share knowledge and learning uh, in a non, in a non voluntary way. So make it part of your, your weekly routine and at the same time offering uh, a lot of meetups to your, uh, to your developers to share knowledge more on a voluntary basis. So allowing you to learn about complete new things that are not related to your role at all. Of course, it's also great to share your experiences like we do today on a conference. Uh, people talk at conferences, you meet each other, and it's a great way of learning, you know, how do people in other organizations build software? Uh, <coughs> it's, it's always an opportunity I think you should take, and it's a great way of, uh, of kind of, you know, completely learning other things, and you can bring the experience back into your organization. Another thing we see organizations doing that uh, move to a model where uh, people can contribute, so more to an open culture of building software, 
is they start participating in open source. And also often they initially you know, participate in open source and then adopt these principles internally. Um, but there's a, there can be a, a lot of benefits in participating in open source. And, and the first thing is, of course, you, you can, it helps you to improve the quality of your software. So if you're able to open source some of your software, so maybe you have projects that are you know, that do not kind of, uh, are not critical to your competitive advantage uh, and that you might think are useful for a, a broader community outside your organization and you're successful in building a community around the project, it can help you to build a better quality software because people contribute, they fix bugs, um, they, they, the software gets used more, so that leads to better software. Uh, it also drives innovation. People at other organizations can come with great ideas and can help you to kind of uh, drive the projects into a, like, you know, a, into a future direction. It also, for an organization, of course, also, I think most of you that uh, contribute back on GitHub, they recognize also that um, it helps you to build a reputation for yourself. And if you apply for a job, often they will ask for your GitHub profile, for example. But as an organization, if you build... Um, a presence in open source, it can really help you to build a, a good reputation. I think you know, um, Netflix maybe is a famous example. I mean, they completely, they went from post-order video company into like a, a cool streaming uh, company, but also they open source most of their software. Um, uh, because it's not critical. I mean, try to build a Netflix. I mean, you need to have all the distribution rights. Uh, you need to be able to produce these, these series. Um, so that is like, uh, you know, very hard to do. But building that software is not critical for, uh, to their uh, competitive advantage. So they can just share it and build a great reputation um, in open source. And that, of course, can help you, and that is what recruiters would love, uh, to basically attract talent. Um, I also see it uh, at for a company like Klarna, for example, in, in Stockholm, so a checkout uh, company that, you know, they are, are very much, um, they have a lo lot of presence in open source and then they do some great stuff with a, around a particular language and that brings other developers into that organization because they see that they're doing great stuff, helping, you know, a programming language to kind of uh, grow um, and that attracts developers uh, across the world to join uh, the organization. It's just an example. Some organizations that successfully adopt these models, um, they are especially struggling to ramp up. Um, so what we see a lot of organizations doing is kind of hiring a community leader um, or it can be sometimes they call it like a software culture team or um <coughs> So Zalando has Lori Apple, for example. She's very much promoting also like uh, Zalando open source, but she's also helping teams within Zalando to adopt these uh, open source principles. At PayPal, they have a whole team dedicated to this. Um, and a community leader can be someone who kind of helps you to build a community within your organization. So she brings people together. She can help spread best practices uh, across the organization. She can help uh, uh, maintainers, for example, to, uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, best practices, help them to give a project direction, help them also with uh, communication. So how can you best communicate? For example, when someone contributes uh, software that is you know, not in scope of your project, so you have to provide you know, feedback like, you know, we're not going to adopt this, so maybe it's best to create a separate library or something. Um, so it's someone who can help, or a team, uh, so Bloomberg also has a team uh, doing this, that can help to kind of maintain a healthy development culture. Um, and that is, I think it's, it can be a key aspect uh, uh, for software development. And this person can also help uh, to open source projects, so it can help you go through like a process. I mean, if you're in a regulated business, like in financial services, for example, I mean, there's a lot more uh, to it to open source something than when you're just like a small company and you have some front-end libraries or something. Uh, you might, you know, have to meet some regulatory uh, requirements or policies uh, within the organization. So a community leader can help you then to guide you uh, to, you know, with legal, work with legal, for example, but also work with marketing to promote your project. So to conclude, I think inner source, so adopting open source principles to build software internally, I think it, it can, <coughs> it's a way to create, you could say, like a strong engineering culture. Um, and it, it builds on the success of open source software development. And 
it's based on a development workflow that enables collaboration. So it allows people to, you know, to make code visible and to provide feedback to each other and help each other. Um, and that, together with the code review and also the automation, can also lead to a better quality software. So it can help you to build better software. If more eyes look at your code, you will have better feedback and create better software. Um, <coughs> And I think it's also kind of a flow that can help you also to avoid blockers. Um, you know, if you can contribute rather than having to wait for a team to deliver, uh, that can really make your you know, software development more smooth. Uh, there's no need kind of to start chasing product owners, for example, to get something in. Um, the other part, of course, is it's, th it's not something that like happens overnight because there's so many cultural aspects uh, to it. Um, and it has an impact across your whole organization. So. I think the most important part of it is that it requires a culture of trust, uh, so where people can take ownership of their work, um, and at the same time, uh, yeah, can work together on like a shared goal. So this is what I wanted to share with you. If you, uh, I think we have s uh, some time left for some questions, and if you want to reach out, feel free to uh, reach out at boss at github.com or I'm boss uh, on GitHub, so my GitHub handle. So are there any questions? Yeah, let's start there and then. Yeah, please go. So the question is like we, we have a lot of code <coughs> that is directly related to our competitive advantage. Uh, so we for a lot of our projects we cannot use GitHub <coughs> um, because that would mean that that code would live on GitHub.com, whether in privately or uh, in a public repository. So is there any way of like GitHub uh, open sourcing that product so we can use it internally, or is there a way to use it like uh, uh, behind the firewall? Is your question right? Um, well, there is. Uh, so GitHub has although we we open source a lot of the components of GitHub itself. So I think we have a lot of open source projects and a lot of parts that are built the GitHub platform are open sourced, but we have no plans to open source GitHub as a platform, as a whole. Um, at the same time, uh, we have, we've had uh, a product, and uh, the interesting thing is it's not very much known, but it's very widely used, and uh, that is called, we call it GitHub Enterprise which is we ship GitHub to organizations. So uh, if you have a team and your, your code needs to live behind the firewall, we've had a product already, s a project, uh, product already since 2012 that allows you to run GitHub uh, on your own infrastructure or, or on, on the private cloud like AWS or Azure. So you can, you can just get uh, GitHub from us um, and, and use it internally if you want. No, it's so uh, it's 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 largely maintained. Uh, it's maintained by you, but we ship it as a as an appliance. So the whole stack is maintained by us, uh, and it's your responsibility uh, responsibility, of course, to run it, to run upgrades, uh, to monitor it a bit. Um, <coughs> so you own it uh, basically uh, the platform. You're welcome. There was. Yeah, so I, th I think that is also, I think, why, for example, the Apache Software Foundation exists, um, because they, they protect you as a contributor of, of uh, open source software. Um, 
so the first one is about you know your your employer. So the first question was I had to you know when I was employed somewhere I had to sign an agreement that I would never ever like share any idea or code uh, like you know outside the organization. So like putting a project in open source or anything. Um, so then of course. Um, the organization itself, of course, needs to support, um, you know, for example, if you want to open source. I mean, inner sourcing does not mean that you bring your ideas outside in the open source world. It could still mean that you adopt principles from open source development but use them internally. At the same time, we see more and more organizations that are allowing their developers to open source, but it's kind of, it is in agreement, of course, with your organization. So whether it's legally bound to your contract or not, um, it, when you open source a project uh, that is a project owned by your organization, uh, then of course that organization kind of, you know, owns it, so needs to basically agree with open sourcing it. And that is also for a lot of organizations the big hurdle they need to take. The developers would love to open source some stuff, but at the same time, the organization is afraid of open sourcing it. They are afraid that there's some secrets uh, in the projects, so maybe even some passwords or things. Um, so it is only something then you can, you know, like if I take an example from Scania, for example, it took them a year to, to create a workflow. So to th someone took the responsibility within that organization to go to legal, go to marketing, so go to all the departments and start working on getting a workflow in place to allow them to open source uh, some of their projects that were, you know. And, but that is really up to the organization. If they do not support it in any way, um, yeah, then, and at the same time, we. To some extent, we can understand, right, that we you do not want, if you build software that has your competitive advantage, you do not want that software to end up in, you know, in kind of uh, a dark space or something where people offer it, which also happens. Um, so I think if the organization is not supporting it, Yeah. And I feel very happy and uh, quite uh, uh, safe to say that I can do this thing in their case because I don't have to work on this project because I'm adapted to the authority of the project. Yeah, I th uh, that is the big benefit. Um, No, uh, that is the big benefit, right? It's people helping out, and and then if you build that feature, you know, it gets it becomes part of that project. It is a model that that is. I mean, if you look at Microsoft in recent, I mean, no one could imagine ten years ago that Microsoft would invest so much in open source, and today they are the largest largest organization on GitHub with many projects in open source, and they happily uh, accept contributions from the community. Um, but it's. At the same time, if you take Spotify as an example, they are really struggling with, you know, shall we open source some of our stuff or not? Um, simply because they, they are afraid of, of, you know, people like, you know, a lot of people starting to contribute and not being able to, you know, act as a, as a proper maintainer of, you know, responding back to people that contribute changes. So it's really kind of, I think if you explore that as an organization, you need to take small steps because, you know, you do not want to get be flooded. It's a luxury, of course, if that happens for your project, um, but it, it could put a lot of pressure on your development teams also. Yeah. And it will be down to say, well, we can change the features. Uh, but if people that are great at open API, and Java can do it, and the library can do it, and Spanish can do it, and even Elixir, they don't have budget for it, for example. If you're supporting them, uh, so what do you do? How do you find this balance? I think it can really help to be. I think documentation can be key here in a matter of communication. So in the sense that if you provide proper contribution guidelines and be very clear about the scope of your projects, then you can kind of uh, create like a funnel 
where the contributions you get are, you know, are really like valuable contributions. Um, so I think what happens is that if you're not clear about where your project's direction, then it, it goes everywhere, right? People just start contributing to it. So that will only slow you down because the features that people request to be included in the project are not features that help the project into the direction. I think communication here, and that can be done through documentation. I know people do not read documentation very well, but you can always point to it. I think a lot of open source projects that um, become more and more successful, uh, they partly are successful because they do very well in being very clear about the direction a project is heading. Um, and because that can be really helpful, because if someone contributes, um, and you do not want to kind of you know put that code into your so you can at least you can just reference to like uh, you know your your co contribution guidelines uh, and the readme file that it's not in scope. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's you mean more like around then the part of the team needs to focus on maintenance and part of the team wants to build new stuff so want to wants to move into the direction. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's yeah. Yeah. It is a luxury problem, problem, I must say. I mean, if your project becomes that popular, I mean, yeah, then it's, and th then it might end up being either budgetary in the sense that, you know, if you are not able to continue to maintain a project in a proper way, so you need more people in order to be involved or split the project. Um, that is also, that is one of the reasons, for example, I think wh why it's, uh, Spotify is f like, you know, hesitant in open sourcing stuff because they think, well, it also, it brings a responsibility that you have to continue to maintain. And, but there's also a way of, if, you, if your library is used by within your organization by others, then try to push those people, the users of that library, into that funnel to become contributors of your project. So try to get some help. So you can use, for example, labels. Uh, or you can even organize an event like having so a hack night or something where you, you say, well, we have, we have all these bugs now uh, that need to be resolved because people are starting complaining and at the same time we need to move on with the project with new features. So organize a hack night, mobilize all the users uh, that, that, li that, that use that library and bring them together for like maybe four hours with pizza or whatever and beer or whatever. Um, and then, uh, you know, just together try to you know to fix some of the obvious bugs uh, in the library so those things can all help but it requires a lot of active maintenance but it's also a luxury problem because then it's great because you have a community for your project yeah okay thank you so much